Right, for our next talk, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce David Liao um, and to hear his uh, living history. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here today because um, I'm not a professor or a paid research scientist. I'm actually a private tutor. I'll tell you that I'll end the slides with saying that you don't need to do in a year what a field did in hundreds of years. And if you need to take a semester off, consider taking a semester off. And also, you don't need to use a PhD to go into academia. What I learned from my PhD and postdoc experience has been useful outside of academia. Okay. So, it's, very, it's a very busy poster. I grew up in Silicon Valley, and in the summer before my junior year, that's 11th grade of high school, I went to a music camp where I found out that singing classically was very difficult. So, and it didn't come ne necessarily really naturally for me. Someone had to really teach me how to do all the, uh, how to do all the techniques. And that was really exciting because that might have been the first time that I really understood that um, if I could, if I could like really pay attention te to technique, uh, really work hard, then I could do things, I could learn to do things that did not come easily to me at first. So that inspired me when I took AP Physics for my first year to really work hard. And I remember this one time I was solving a problem. I, I mean, I'm pretty sure everyone has solved this problem already, but you have the two blocks connected by a string draped over a pulley. And I remember that that first time I drew the free body diagrams and I wrote the equations out for Newton's second law. And I set the tension in one equation equal to the tension in the other equation. It felt like the string connecting the blocks became real. And I felt that it became viscerally real for me. And that was a really amazing feeling to connect like the theory to reality. So I was really inspired. And then um, in that year, I uh, placed 10th in the nation in the American Association of Physics Teachers Physics Bowl. And then I placed the next year into the United States physics team. So junior year, senior year of high school, I was like very sure I wanted to do physics. And I was really excited, as indicated by this icon showing a battery that is fully charged. <laughs> so uh, what, did I, what did I do then? I went to college at Harvey Mudd College, where I eventually got my bachelor's in physics in 2005. And you can start seeing a little bit of murmurs of being kind of lost and not knowing exactly what I wanted to do. Um, there's a difference between the excitement for a young teenager thinking like, wow, you can you know, naively think you can solve it all the problems in the world just by writing f net equals ma and then realizing that when you get to actual questions all the questions are a little bit more a little bit more in the weeds so i was bouncing around uh at first doing some work in uh, optical physics where i was studying how we could calculate the amount of photon noise or bosonic photon noise that would uh, cause problems with the sensitivity of optical coherence tomographs and then i bounced over to quantum chemistry, <laughs> which is uh, quite a bit different because I was very interested in knowing um, how we could justify various approximations like the orbital approximation uh, that are used for calculating approximate um, electronic energy level energies for molecules and atoms. I just want to point out that part of what kept me sane through all of the items we're going to visit is this bit of music that I hinted at but over here. So that's when I learned to sing, right? I, I think like a very important part of surviving through college, is a, a lot of work was to also be in the chamber choir, the concert choir, and to have some voice lessons in the joint music program of Harvey Mudd College and uh, the other colleges, uh, three of the other colleges in the consortium of colleges nearby. I think a lot of people have been told the phrase, like when you transition from undergraduate to graduate school, um, it's not a sprint anymore, it's a marathon. And I think that was really important and I wish I had heard that because you can see by the end of college, my battery is very much drained. And what I probably should have done then was taken a semester off just to like breathe or maybe travel or just do nothing. Um, I don't know, watch like Will and Grace for a whole semester, <laughs> but I didn't really know what I was doing. So I kind of just went with the flow at Harvey Mudd College. I think about 50% or so of the physics 
uh, undergraduates end up just going to graduate school. So I did the same thing, and that's how I landed at Princeton University, where I eventually got my PhD in physics in 2010. Um, most of my work was done with Bob, um, was done in Bob Austin's group in physical biology or biological physics. I forget which way he prefers it said. Um, and <laughs> and I, I'm pretty sure that's a, an issue for a lot of us. Um, and uh, toward the end, around 2008, 2009, 2010, uh, the National Cancer Institute uh, started putting together this thing called the Physical Sciences Oncology Network, which was, I think back then, a $150 million um, centers, you know, those centers research network, where they were trying to get physicists, chemists, mathematicians, engineers, um, biologists, oncologists, clinicians, patient advocates, all to talk together <laughs> to try to figure out new ways to look at cancer biology and cancer treatment. So uh, toward the end of my time, in, uh, my PhD tenure at Princeton, Bob Austin's group became involved in that and built up a center with Thea Tilsty, who is a professor of pathology at the University of uh, California, San Francisco. And uh, in that, uh, sorry, <coughs> excuse me. And so we found different ways to uh, uh, to look at cancer in new ways. And it's not, it ended up being kind of a free fall. So it's not just like, let's go find out how to write F net equals MA uh, for uh, cancer biology. But it also got pretty wild. It was like looking at ways we could compare the um, development and dissemination of biofilms, bacterial biofilms, to the social structures of uh, malignant tissues, uh, cancer tissues and cancer cell populations. Okay. And... When I started interacting with the people at U the UCSF, I've, I found that it was really interesting to talk about uh, mathem mathematical sciences uh, to people who don't necessarily have a big background working with equations and uh, differential equations and things like that. So three, four, okay, there's a lot of jumping across the United States. Um, <laughs> 2010 to 2012, I did my postdoc with Thea Tilsti at the University of California, San Francisco, continuing to be a so-called young investigator in the physical sciences oncology network. And we worked on, for instance, studying how he heterogeneity in uh, cancer, cell t uh, cancer cell populations and tissues uh, could be taken advantage of to develop maybe new treatment scheduling techniques. Okay. Oh, I forgot to mention, I'm sorry. Um, at the UCSF, I continue to like try to be sane by, you can see over here, singing in an a cappella group we're called the vocal chords, uh, and that's me right there. Okay. <laughs> at the University of California, San Francisco, I was working in a lab with, there was a pathologist, we had some traditional biologists, and I also worked with um, a patient advocate. So one of the things you notice in these interdisciplinary fields is that um, a lot of there's a lot of classical quantitative biology, mathematical biology background information that not everyone has. So one of the things I actually enjoy doing was making a website called quant.bio where I made these video tutorials to teach people like all this background information. If you actually go to that website and download all the videos, you can... <laughs> Basically, if you're on a continent, transcontinental flight, if you watch my videos for eight hours, then even if you don't come from a mathematics background, you can be ready to participate in a mathematical biology conference. Your brain will also probably be fried, but you'll be ready. <laughs> okay, so <coughs> two things happened at this point. I found out that it was really fun to talk to people who don't come from a physics background or a mathematics background to tell them about mathematics and physics ways of reasoning. And also, I was getting very tired, as indicated by the battery icon over here, because I was flying back and forth uh, every month to uh, vi well work in the San Francisco and visit my boyfriend in New Jersey. So at this point, uh, I talked to Thea, and we kind of changed the way the dial or the knob was set. And I shifted to being a you know, small part-time consultant and being more of a full-time private tutor in New Jersey, where I am now. And 
as I made the transition, I continued to work on tutorial materials, for instance, like teaching people um, with uh, who don't have so much of a math background how to apply, I don't know, differential equations like evolutionary game theory equations. And uh, starting to transfer those talents and skills that I developed from my graduate school years and postdoc years into my tutoring business. You can kind of see like how the way I illustrate my tutorials for uh, for the academia community has translated into, for instance, teaching high school students how to understand the impulse momentum theorem for AP Physics 1. Uh, I did not plan the timing well, so I just, uh, let me go b uh, back to the punchlines I wanted to make. Okay, uh, what what is this? You don't need to do in a year what a field did in hundreds of years. Um, I wish I had been told this a long time ago, but when I was in college, uh, primarily what I was exposed to was, uh, you know, you go into a test, and in, an in one hour, you magically, over four problems that are maybe 15 minutes each, or maybe a few problems that are 20, 20 minutes each, you regurgitate hundreds of years of work in each of these uh, problems. Um, you can do that because the work has already been done and the testing environment is very contrived and sterilized and controlled. But when you're doing research, you should be aware that that's not necessarily a realistic expectation. So try not to necessarily have that expectation for yourself and also for other uh, try not to necessarily have that expectation for other people so that you can avoid causing yourself to burn out and also causing other people to burn out around you. If you need to take a semester off, consider taking a semester off if you can. Okay, I, I'll try to rush this, I'm sorry. So I am really grateful that I had the experience of going through the PhD and the postdoc because the things I learned about communicating with people um, from different backgrounds, like using graphics to talk to people when they don't have a background working with equations, that has, been pr that has proved to be very useful in my everyday life. I sing with the New Jersey Gay Men's Chorus, and you may know t you may know that a couple years ago there was a massive pandemic that <laughs> started and made it very hard for choral singing groups to sing together. I was doing some research, learning about low latency technologies, and I used my experience communicating, teaching, and drawing diagrams to help give instructions. They look like IKEA furniture assembly instructions to teach other people in the course how to set up. Uh, how to set up the technology, and what that means was that a small group of us, up to 11 people at one point, even during the pandemic when we couldn't sing together, we were able to sing together live over the internet, and actually st it feel felt like being in the same room. So for that um, ability, I'm very grateful for everything that I learned through uh, my PhD and postdoc experience. Thank you. Thank you, David. And I'm clapping on behalf of the uh, audience. Um, have uh, first a question from Sri and then from Simone. So uh, Sri, could you ask your question? Uh, thanks, Shirley. Uh, David, thank you so much. Um, I wonder if you would tell us um, how you, so, so much of the story is about avoiding being pigeonholed into boxes that are not made for one. Um, so I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about the joys and the challenges. Okay, so uh, I don't have a bow tied answer to that. All I can say is um, there was something uh, uh, that struck me from Eve's talk about like not being a cog in a wheel. And this thing about like, I don't know what I want to do back here. Um, a lot of that was a murmur of I don't want to do something where I feel like I'm just doing some research project because someone else said like it's, it's like they're higher. I don't want to do it just because it's what they're paying me to do. I don't want to feel like I'm being used to do this for someone else. Um, and I, I don't know whether that like say it confessing that it's going to help anyone figure out how to also not feel pigeonholed or like forced into something. But I'll just like let you know that that's how I felt. Um, I, you know, it, the feeling has finally gone away, finally, <laughs> after all these years, but it's not because I deliberately try to make it go away. It's just that, um, when I've been doing tutoring and stuff and uh, teaching people how to use the technology to sing together online, 
I don't know what happened, but something about that just felt like I, I earlier this year I had this epiphany where I realized that I actually liked what I was doing, and to the point that okay, we live in a society where we have to make money to pay the bills to eat food. However, and so we we choose what we do, t keeping that in mind. But I realized that even if I didn't have mon have to make money, I would probably be doing something really really similar to. Uh, what I'm doing now. So I guess the advice is you might not know how you might not know how to find what you're doing, but you can also trust that eventually, even in a kind of not really well directed path, the skills that you learn along the way can turn into something that will s you'll be surprised and they'll turn out to be useful. Thank you so much. Back to you, Charlie. Great, thank you. Uh, and one more question from Simone: uh, What are your favorite teaching and tutorial technologies? So back in the days of UCSF, uh, talking to biologists, I would like to use PowerPoints to carefully animate all the features that I would want to talk about when teaching people how to, do, uh, how to analyze an equation. But to be honest, what I found is that it's very important to, for someone to see how a hand moves across a page so they can keep track of stuff as opposed to, oh my gosh, there's a PowerPoint and every, my eyes just glaze over. So actually one of the most important tools is literally this camera hanging off of a mount where I can, uh, I can do this. And there's something about being able to watch someone's hand vibrate across the screen that like, just pulls you in and helps you to avoid <coughs> zoning out. Thank you, that's awesome. You know, that actually reminds me of something I did with my class. I showed them the same equation on PowerPoint slides, and then I wrote it down. They're like, oh, we get it now. It's like, it's literally the same, but maybe it's- It's like the moving right. of yeah. the hand, yeah. That's really cool, thanks. Great, thank you again, David. Um, thank you for a wonderful talk.